One of the things that we mentioned um, in the description of this event was the idea of inclusion. And I was thinking about that in relation to Ingrid's, the, the piece that you showed with the um, girl getting um, chosen to be May Queen and the kind of joy and elation in those stills that you chose of her being kind of plucked um, and being you know, given this title. Um, and obviously the question of inclusion in relation to folk song is, is, is relevant as well because through playing this music, there's a sense in which you can become part of something that you're otherwise marginalized from. So I was wondering if both of you can sort of think where the black artist sits, if you think about the poles of inclusion and exclusion or whether or not we should just sort of do away with that idea altogether and maybe the role of the black artist is to strive for something beyond inclusion. Um, I guess with that particular film about that, the sisters actually, it's the two sisters in the relationship, the one who isn't chosen to be there, the May Queen, and the, within the film, the money shot, as they say, is at the end when she's sitting on the May Queen throne and she's got the crown and they're all singing. I, I never wanted to show that one in the, in, in the intervention that I've put in because, because it's so gratifying to see her grinning. There's something about, even though she's a May Queen, she has to sort of bow to her, the, the, the court that are in front of her, the other school children. So there's lots of different ways that she's included, that they're in that school in the middle of Northamptonshire. Their father is Nigerian, so he's in the Merchant Navy, so that's why he's, they're there living, um, living in that particular village for a number of years. So they're, and it, it's staged in, and not staged at the same time. I think they always wanted to ha her to be the May Queen, but the, the, all the children were part of it, and it was there for the filming, but they, the children never ever saw the film. It was whisked off. So they're included, in, and it, there's an inclusion, but there's an exclusion at the same time, but they are at the center in, within the construction within that film. They, the two sisters, particularly the May Queen, are at the center. But there's a difference in the way that they're portrayed, even when they're lining up to go to school and uh, out of the playground. So there's something about being included in that film, and it's all very nice, and it's an old particular version of England that's in the middle of the war at that particular stage. But then you, when I look at the shot, their, their hair is very whack. And it's, you, can, you can tell that, OK, there's not someone who understands black Afro hair combing their hair. You know, every sort of black woman who sees it thinks, oh, someone's got to sort their hair out. So there's something happening there. They're, they're, their care and their looking after is not quite there, especially if their dad's mm -hmm. away as well. So it's a, it's a beautiful, strange film at the same time. And then she's voted and everyone looks blissfully happy. But, you know, underneath, I was like, well, how long were they there? What is that going to be like? I mean, it took them a BFI number of years to find out who these girls were, but they eventually found who they were and got the story and everything. So it, it's, it, it's included, it's inclusive in that film, but the whole construction of that type of England is, is a fabrication. So they're included in something that's a fabrication. Mm, that's but it's real at the same time. Certainly real um, moments in everybody's life, all those children in the film. I agree. I agree <coughs> completely with that. And I think actually the, the idea that if you perform the right moves and gestures and habits that then you're on a sort of accelerator to uh, inclusion is really a terrible liberal mistake to make because it seems to me that the history of assimilating peoples um, does not bear that out and that what you find very often is that there is one channel of violence turned towards the unassimilable and another channel of violence turned towards those who assimilate too well. And I think if you learn um, England better than the English people, most of what you, who are bereft, let's say, of England, if you try and learn that, it's not going to end well. Because all that you will do is draw hatred and violence towards yourself for not being what you are supposed to be. And if you appear, therefore, as something else or worse than what you aren't supposed to be, something unclassifiable, mm. 
Mm. You're supposed to be a Negro. You're supposed to be that. You're supposed to be that. I, because I was thinking about that when Beth was talking this morning about the way people interacted with her when she was training and so on. The, the inability to imagine that she knew what she was talking about or she had skills or a ways of, of communicating and, and teaching. You know, if, if you cross the category, if you blur the category, all that's waiting for you is violence. All that's waiting for you is blood that will put you back where you will try. It won't necessarily succeed, don't get me wrong. Mm. But, but there will be a very violent reaction that will try and put you back in the place that was prepared for you that you should have occupied but weren't occupying. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, uh, I'm going to give you a mic. Yeah, thank you for those really rich presentations, really thought-provoking and bringing loads of things to mind for me. I think I sort of explained to some people in the room earlier that I work in a Museum of English Rural Life. And I'm conscious of a very inward-looking gaze with some of the things that I look after <coughs> and work with. Um, and in that context, we have a huge collection of films, and I suspect films made by the same people who directed that film, possibly even a copy of that film, I don't know. Um, but I'm I'm wondering about this sort of sense of inward looking versus outward looking. That's a film that's made uh, for consumption and, and sort of viewing in colonial context, but not within England. And I think an entirely different vision of that village and that film would have been made that would have been entirely uh, exclusive in terms of um, making the, the the appearance of those girls absent from the village for any of the kind of films that, that I've certainly seen from the archives that we look after. So I think there's a sort of tension of inward looking and outward looking in materials being made in that context. Um, so I, I don't know quite what I'm getting at here, but I think there's, there's something about a sort of pan-global sense of what these landscapes and countrysides and ideas of the, the rural represent for us that I think we struggle to grasp um, and articulate and I was struck uh, particularly by the wildly exaggerated descriptions of winter comment. Um, uh, this, is, this is hot on the heels in the 1950s of the worst winter that the UK has ever experienced, which actually happens to be my own father's earliest memory, sitting on the back of a, a Caterpillar D2 tractor, um, swaddled in some, some old Hessian sack by my grandfather. Um, but this idea of of memory and weather and, and how you articulate these things also resonates with something I heard in an interview uh, with Andrea Levy talking about her own mother's arrival in the UK um, as part of the Windrush generation when she was made to fill in a form in which she was supposed to describe what winter was to her. But she'd never experienced an English winter, so she had to describe a Caribbean winter. But I wonder whether that can be part of a concept of a wider sense of the countryside, of winter, of, of the seasons, that maybe we need something that's a little less specific to place. And I don't know whether either of you had any, had any thoughts on that. I guess it kind of resonates with some of the, the, the music that you're talking about as well. Well, yeah, in Africa there are two seasons, aren't there, not four? So, so yeah, I, I actually, I'm, I, I, like, I like the rhythm of seasons and the rhythm of, of, of the, the changing uh, year. and. Because I, I I crave slowness and I want to decelerate things and 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 be slower all the, all the time. <clears throat> Engaging the process of the seasons is is something that I strive after. So and that's why one of the reasons I want to go out for a walk in the wild place or something like that. <coughs> so so I don't I don't know that um, the the problem is when the inquiry becomes a, a test of the on the other side of which are certain rights or entitlements or citizenship or a governmental um, argument about belonging I don't I think it's good to for people to to uh, discuss the to discuss the interrelatedness of their weather and their seasons and their year with others who don't share that difference and I think that's an enriching possibility but you know nationalism doesn't allow for those horizons to to come into view and that fusion of horizons is something that people push away because it can be quite frightening even our, you know, the wonderful work of the, the people in Bar Barclay Square, you know, that's been going on with the Nightingales and everything, we all saw this on, well, those of us who still watch the news saw it on the news. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, this was pointed out in our house that these, these are not English birds, you know. They don't have passports, 
You know, they don't, they don't have national attachments. They're here for, what, six, seven weeks if we're lucky, and then they go, go back or go elsewhere. So, so how one combines a relationship with the natural world uh, with a, a disjunctive relationship with the alienating governmental mechanisms which withhold or award citizenship um, is, is, a, is another matter. I mean, there are all sorts of tests that people have derived, you know, to make those judgments. Uh, I think winter, winter's interesting, isn't it, um, to think about winter, because it's so often that's the, that's the place where Caribbean belonging comes undone. <laughs> it is. That's the place, you know. They, they, these footballers wear gloves, you know, and they, they haven't got the bottle for a, a, an English winter, you know, because it's, it's cold and wet. And, uh, you know, that's why we can't have half the world serving in our army, because they really can't hack it on Salisbury Plain, you know, when, 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 when the sub-zero winds begin to blow in from Siberia, wherever they're coming from this year. So, so I think winter is a particular kind of <coughs> test of belonging, actually. And, and, and I think, you know, I, that's why I prefer autumn and spring, I think, probably. But uh, there isn't any summer to worry about. Yeah. So, so, so I think winter, winter should be preserved and used as a way of managing those discrepancies outside of the things that governments can do with them. Yeah. And I also think, you know, think of my father's education. It was, you know, Guyana should have been, or Guyana would have been a, an English colony. So they would have had an English, you know, in terms of what they were reading, totally through the eyes of colonizers. So my dad, you know, knew, knew about William Wordsworth and all those, mm. those references to a particular type of rural English or countryside English. And it's so, you know, but he's also reading novels from America, Guyanese, Guyanese novelists as well. You know, it's not just one tiny strand, you know, they're cosmopolitan people, they're living in the capital of Guyana, they're, you know, they, they know about the rest of the world, they've got, you know, the world service, I presume at that point, so they are reading things, they are reading English poetry, they are reading books, so they, they know about the rest of the world, they know well, about they, Russia, cold. I think, I think, I think they actually probably <coughs> know more, and certainly my mum's case, I speak yeah. from my mum's case, she knew English romantic poetry and English flora and fauna more intimately than the flora and fauna that was outside the window. She engaged it in a different way. Yeah, my father yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. So but that's she, a discrepancy yeah. too. When she came to England, you know, she was there in the garden. That was her first, con you know, contact with the rural, or with the, with the natural, the countryside. It was the back garden. Just very quickly. Yeah, I think in relation to that, that's really interesting because in, in relation to what I was trying to say very badly about the films is that actually people in rural England uh, in the 50s or in the 40s when that film was made would have known <coughs> probably next to nothing and, and, and would have been peddled uh, very particular and problematic ideas about other parts of the empire yeah. and yet people in other parts of the empire yeah. knew their world intimately and, and much more powerfully albeit still through a sort of problematic colonizer's sure. lens but you know there's something really interesting and empowering in that as well as sort of problematic, I think. I guess as well also making sense of those films in a completely different way, I think. The lots of scenes of animal um, animals and farming you know, that's to do with showing bounty and productivity and but then you you can make sense of those films in different ways. I can't know what those are, but I think there's, there's other interpretation of those films that we'll never know. Xenia Omas? I wonder, Paul, if you could talk a little bit more about you saying that you want to pers uh, um, pursuing slowness and deceleration. Uh, what it made me think of is um, the way in which like rural life or countryside life is often imaged as like slow and relaxing and pensive, and it, and it can be all that. But you can also work yourself to death on a farm quite easily. Um, yeah, I wonder if you could just expand on that. Maybe. I don't know, I might be making a relationship that isn't there, but I also think there is something quite interesting about the actual like um, literal longevity of some of the singers that you're speaking about as well, like who, who have and are living quite a long time. So I, I wondered if there was a relationship between slowness and like a, not necessarily a life preservation in terms of no death, but like a, an insurance of a, of a regeneration of some sort. Well, I don't know enough about Sai or Nadia's medical histories to be able to give you a comment on that that's worth anything. Um, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to play down the fact that, um, that working on the land is um, likely to shorten your life. Yeah, no, 
um, I just said, I was talking from my own point of view, because I was thinking actually about some of the things that were said this morning about time, about not having enough time. Or, and one of the things I crave is the transformation in temporality that comes from being outside with animals and plants. And in particular, I like to be with very old trees because I feel that from a very old trees, I, I acquire or can acquire a, a different sense of time. I mean, the, some of the trees that I really loved as a child now on Hampstead Heath are dying. And they're three, 400, 450 years old trees and they're falling to pieces and dying. And I, I don't see anywhere that they're being replaced actually so i think i'm not when i talk about slowing things down i don't mean that there's a lack of pain or tragedy in that shifted tempo i just mean i want to shift the tempo i want to find the break and if i'm you know crawling around under a bush listening to nightingales as we were last week then i find the break is there or, or a break is there and it the transformation of the sensorium that comes from that proximity to other temporalities some human some not human is, 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 I think, restorative. Uh, and I assume that's what Beth was getting at with the argument about mental health, that actually, if you, if you want to be on the tempo of the digital world, that, that's fine. But actually, that can be terribly, terribly destructive of your well-being on many, many levels. And that you might find that if you can disconnect from that, that another tempo is possible, the tempo of the waves. If we're at the beach, the waves, there's a rhythm there, for example, that many people find restorative. And there are a number of these other things that one can find. So, so I was just really pointing, pointing to that. I, I'd, I'd love to know why they've both managed to live into their 90s. They're two remarkable and extraordinary people. Everyone who's ever spoken to... I, I haven't seen Nadia for 15, 16 years, so I don't know how she is these days. But everybody who has ever interviewed her or spoken to her talks about what a remarkable woman she was. And um, not just as a creative, a creative sense, but in, in a sort of moral and political sense, somebody with good judgment. Um, and Sai, of course, you know, if you read his poetry or uh, look at him acting on the screen or um, think about how he managed his sort of celebrity as the um, UK equivalent to Harry Belafonte, which is, I guess, what he was, um, you know, there are similar things. I, I put up his um, concentration camp book of all the books that I could have put up. Um, the, the, it's the, one of the less metaphysical of his books. It's not his poetry or his philosophy writing. Um, because I feel that so much of the test of belonging is the test of the military. Are you prepared to die for this country? Are you prepared to kill for this country? Okay? And by those tests, you know, which are different to the do you know what winter is in this country test, um, he passed. He passed. Okay? So I'm, I'm kind of interested, as, as she did too, actually. She's in the military too, Nadia. So, so that's a kind of interesting test of, of the transition between a kind of colonial citizenship and a, and a sort of, you know, what do we call it? I want to say modern, because it's England we're talking about here. Um, let's say the, the kind of 70s version of citizenship that comes in with the Commonwealth Immigration Act in the late 70s. The one that, the, no, not the late 70s, the mid 60s, the one where the Labour government introduces the, the grandfather clause into our, into our civil law, which says, if you don't have a grandparent born in this country, you're going to have a different quality of citizenship than everybody else. Labour government. We haven't got um, that much time, so I'll just take one really quick question and then you can maybe have discuss these uh, uh, questions afterwards. Not so much a question, <clears throat> but just to say that um, I was quite moved that you had chosen to play the records of Nadia Katus. Uh, and I'm going to be on the phone to her tonight. Oh to tell her uh, that you had chosen her songs. And I'm sure that she will be very um, pleased because she is, at her age, incredibly intellectually alert. It's as if she's no different from she was 15, 20, 30 years ago. She has um, gone into a kind of self-imposed um, reclusiveness. And um, she's very reluctant to uh, venture out for all kinds of reasons. But um, she's one of the most remarkable people that I think I've met, simply because um, the scope of, of her experiences, the people she has dealt with over the, over the years, you know, and so intellectually alert and committed in all kinds of ways.
Thank you. That's a great place to end um, that session. So thank you. Can you all join me in giving Ingrid and Paul a big round of applause?